came that early April morning at an air base in Colorado. Forty flying fortresses line the apron. Four thousand men march out for a final inspection. They've trained long and hard with these ships. The 400 men who fly them and the 3,600 who work to keep them flying. Now the 351st Bombardment Group is ready. By the dawn's early light, it assembles for overseas combat. You're on your way, Joe. This is it. With his staff, Colonel William A. Hatchie, Jr. looks over his four squadrons. You feel the old man is proud of you. He finds no fault with you today, nor you with him. You'd fly his wing to hell and gone. Sergeant Philip J. Halls, top turret gunner from Springfield, Missouri. He feels that way. So does his pal Kenny, Sergeant Kenneth L. Halls, ball turret gunner from Perkins, Oklahoma. Related? No. They think they might have been several generations ago back in Germany. But now, just two guys with the same uncle, Sam. Meet their pilot, Lieutenant Theodore Argeropoulos of Redding, California. Arge's brother is in the Air Corps, too. Their dad was born in Greece. Yes, the Greeks have a word for it. Fight. Their bombardier, Lieutenant Daniel F. Stevens of Chicago. He can bat a thousand with a Norton bomb sight. Sergeant Paul J. Posty, Paul Terry Gunner. His dad came from Italy. Paul was formerly a pastry cook. He's got one brother in the Navy. Another, a Marine, missing in action. Here's Sergeant Tim Touchett, tail gunner from Mariana Lake, New Mexico. On the reservation, they named him Aki. That means boy in Navajo. Uncle Sam's boy, too. A few last-minute instructions, and we're off. The compass points northeast. Take another look down there. That's your part of the Earth. Out of that desert, those mountains, those fields has grown the American way of life. What you're fighting for. You remember the Colonel's quiet words? Men, the enemy has asked for it. Let him have it. Seek no quarter, nor give any beyond reason. Be firm, be just, and Godspeed you all. Eight and a half hours out of Newfoundland, another sunrise. It's rising out of the red of battle, this sun. But 40 more B-17s, three minutes apart, have roared across the Atlantic night. The Irish coast looks up to say, top of the morning. And a lake in the Ulster Highlands gives the navigator a checkpoint. Off the Scottish coast, Dernia Craig is a signal for right rudder south, across the English Midlands. Pilots are impatient with lack of sleep. Head up, boy. Pour on the coal. Let's get there. speakers instead of these big white stars. Don't worry, folks. We're dropping nothing today, just our hats in the ring. Hello, Missy. We've brought something for you and brother. Chewing gum and chocolate bars. And there's a crate of oranges in the ball turret. Ah, there, Grandpa. We'll be seeing you for a glass of that. And there's the base. 400 acres of dispersal areas. RAF is on hand to welcome us. Set her down, Colonel. Set her down. The 351st becomes part of the 8th Air Force. We've reached the battlefront. <laughs> the combat crews move into English barracks. They give them those simple, quiet names for which Americans are famous. Two weeks later, the ground crews arrive. Hi, Gus. Great boat trip, huh? Only seven days and without any escort, too, hmm? See any submarines? Oh, a hundred of them, huh? 
Well, I guess you ought to know, Gus. They tell me you was hanging over the rail all the way. Next day, big doings. Class A uniform. Shine those buttons. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Gloucester. Brother to the King of England drops in and is greeted by the old man. What's up? The Sergeant Major says the RAF is handing over the field to us. himself doing a world inspection flight. He tells you you've got a tough assignment. This is one head man who knows and doesn't kid you. We have the privilege to meet General Aker, Commanding General, 8th Air Force. All right, Major, sir. Yeah, glad to see you. How are you coming to this camera training film of yours? Well, it's a little early to tell you, sir, but uh, we're turning a camera on everything and everybody. Well, I know what General Arnold had in mind in having you make this gunnery picture. Captain Gable, our gunners are already the best in the business. But if they were only 10% better, it'd cost the Germans another 100 fighters a month. So fire away, gunners. Plenty more practice before that first mission. The sleeve is a folk wolf. Track him. If you don't, he might get you. And you might have to bail out. Over the channel, perhaps. But if you do, a spitfire of the Air Sea Rescue Service is bound to spot you. A stubborn, tough gang, this outfit. They'll go after you any time, any place. They picked up men three miles off the French coast with Heine defense batteries screaming, No, you don't. Their answer is always, Sorry, old boy, we will. on your identification of aircraft. Over here, it's with a real McCoy, such as this captured Ju-88. There it is. Everything up forward, punched under the nose. But the Canadian pilot says it's a sweet flying ship. Yes, sir. A dangerous all-purpose aircraft. Or the Heinkel 111K. A bad hombre, but he makes good airplanes, gentlemen. These will be a happy sight in days to come. Your fighter escort, that big barrel nose job, circled in white. Your own American P-47, the Thunderbolt, side by side with a graceful spit. These are what you don't shoot at. You hear daily lectures on security given by Major Scott. Your Scotch-born intelligence officer. Let's stop kidding ourselves. This flying field is only 20 minutes from the battlefront. The dumb spies have all been shot. The smart ones are still living. And you will run into one of them tonight at the Red Lion Pub. And if you go to the pub... Remember, one pound... It's not one dollar, but four dollars. And that equals 20 shillings. One shilling equals 12 pennies, which equals 20 cents. One English penny equals two American pennies. And don't throw your pennies around. Uh, Major, it seems to me the paper in this town is not very durable. 
What do you mean durable? I have this one for 20 years. <laughs> What is it, Fred? What is it? One of those bitter lessons you learn in training. Flying close formation in rough air at low altitude is no good, gentlemen. Save that for high altitude when you're headed for the target. Next morning, we crawl out of the sack to find Britishers on the field again. Big Halifax bombers that have blasted Berlin during the night. Their own field was closed in by weather, so they dropped in on us for breakfast. Say, uh, Percy, how's the act over there? Rough? Oh, not half bad, yet. Well, cheerio, lads. Thanks to the m and So long, Percy, old boy. We'll be finding out for ourselves one of these days. That day arrives. The order comes over the teletype. The communications clerk carries it to Colonel Milton, operations officer. To Colonel Burns, deputy commander. The old man is on the phone. Then in the briefing room. I'm summarizing. Remember your route in to this DR point where you go northeast to avoid this black area. D 47s will escort you to about this point on the way in, and Spit 9 will meet you about here on the way out and escort you all the way home. And now the weather officer. Weather's plenty important. You'll probably have to go over and above the altitude that you're scheduled to fly, 23,000 feet. From the IP to the target, the winds will be very strong tailwinds, and your ground speed should be well about 200 and 50, 260 miles an hour. The visibility is good everywhere east of that cold front, and the temperature at the target should be comparatively warm, minus 25 degrees centigrade. Today is your baptism of fire. If Lieutenant Argyropoulos ever felt responsibility, he feels it now. In the armament shop, his crew is picking up their guns. Now remember, fellas, don't let them get too close trying for a sure kill. The main job is to bring these airplanes back. We've got plenty of ammunition. Keep them out there at long range. Oh, we know. They've given you an easy hop. Only three and a half hours in and out. What they call a milk run. But you'll remember this first mission. You don't admit it now. You wouldn't show it for the world. But later, you find out everybody else felt the same way you did. Flash order from Wing Headquarters. Wing wants three more ships added to the high group. Three more bomb bays have to be loaded. Got to step on it. Positions in the formation change. Sergeants Kenny and Phil Hull. Gunners think only of smooth working guns and plenty of ammunition. Ammunition's cheap. Six cents worth of 50 caliber wanged into the cockpit of a Messerschmitt. That's what will bring you home. What did that weatherman say? 30 below over the target? Electrically heated suits. The Air Corps dresses for every occasion. Yes, everything has to be right, brother. Check everything. Every strap tight, every buckle set, everything understood. You get into your flak suit. Mighty heavy material, but it wears well, the man says. A thermos of hot coffee. The uh, joker who brings it says it'll help keep you awake. Hard straps on his throat pipe. Over this intercom system, he'll be able to talk to every man in the ship. And they can talk to him. They'll be talking for keeps today. Well, that clear from the tower ought to be along any minute now. 
There it is. Start engines. Colonel's already been on missions. The seasoned outfits. Today, he leads you on your first. Yeah. trees, Major? No, that's not them. Just a flock of crows. I was a truck driver on Canal Street, but I never felt like this before. All right, the ambulances. I gotta be casual. You know, carefree and easy, like the dock. Listen, wise guys, talk to us. The ground crew for each ship. We'll tell you how to feel. Okay, here they are. Steve. 
That's from me, Pete Provenzale, your navigator. Okay, Phil, chuck up number one. Nice driving, Captain Art. You sure know your evasive action. Uh-oh, Harry caught something. A 20 millimeter right across his radio. Arge looks at a hole in the horizontal stabilizer. Nothing at all. Hi, Pete. Come on, let's stow these guns and get to interrogation. Yeah, you're feeling pretty cocky. Nobody blamed you. It's great to get that first one over with. But this one was pretty easy, remember? You got a lot more to go. Longer ones, tougher ones. Take it easy, boys. Take it easy. Back from the raid comes Major Lewis Nowak, group surgeon. Doc flew this first mission to study the physical reactions of men in combat. He didn't have to go, but that's the kind of a doc he is. And today, on the walls of the officer's mess, begins the chronological record of the group's success. Coutre, a German fighter base in Belgium. And he doesn't live there anymore. In the meantime, we find Kenny and Phil cleaning their guns in front of the armament shop. Hello, Captain. Hello, Captain. Well, how was it? You know, Captain, I don't think those Germans like it. Are you ready to go again? Sure. You ought to get this thing over. But did you learn anything you didn't know before? Plenty. At home, they told us the Germans made most of the on the tail. Today, most of them are on the nose. Yeah. Most of the time, I had my third point at 12 o'clock. They must have fired a thousand rounds. That's all these guns, Ken. All set? Yes, check those guns. You had plenty more use for them the next two weeks. Emden, Kiel, Willemshaven, St. Nazaire, Raymond. And every swastika stands for a Hun pilot that asked for it and got it. days when enemy targets were hidden by weather. So the more energetic of you found relaxation in peaceful combat. While the more studious men discussed tactical charts and maps, uh, or something. But the more cultured of the group, like Kenny and Phil, went into the nearby villages to visit the quaint old cathedral, churches and shops in the English countryside surrounding us. Or on days when they were confined near the base, the old cathedrals and shops would come out to see them. Hmm. This little shop wants to go home. Meanwhile, back at the kitchen, we find a very unhappy and angry man. Hello, Sergeant Hello, Captain Gable. What's this? I thought you were a boy, too, Gunner. I thought so too, sir, but I've been grounded. Oh, your pants took up on you, huh? Yes, sir. They found I was shipped at the Brown Derby in Hollywood, and now they have me in the mess making a cake tonight for the officer's party. Nothing you can do about getting back into combat? I don't think so, Captain. Well, Sergeant, remember this. There are two kinds of cake. One of them's good, and the other one... I'll be seeing Gals or parties, you're still fighting a war. And you're getting mighty good at it. Nobody knows it better than the sucker who started it. Little Adolf. Well, Sergeant Forsting, back in the combat, huh? Yes, sir. How'd you manage it? Well, sir, you know what you said. There are two kinds of cake. So Fosty's back in the air with you. You're blowing factories and power plants a thousand feet in the air. Okay, how about you, Winchester? Well, I'm a little excited. What yeah. happened? Yeah. I have a little present here for you. What's that, black? Came in the side of the radio room and hit the buckle on my parachute. It's all on the floor. Well, who else is playing? Uh, Phil. Uh, what time was that? It was about uh, 1,600 hours. $1,600. Where did it happen? You know, that's what it happened. Yeah, it's right here, just east of Boston. East of Boston. That's right. We'll confirm that. Oh, I saw it. I confirmed it. After he fired it, it uh, came down and passed underneath our left wing and exploded right underneath us. 
Nobody should bail out. And when you hand out punishment like this, you've got to take some, too. The day you got back from over Villa Couple, just outside of Paris, there was plenty rubbish. Signal flares. That means wounded aboard. What's tough about it was, you had to bring your bombs back. You couldn't drop them. When you reached a target, you found it closed over by weather. That's an order when you're flying over France. No indiscriminate bombing. Just German installations. attack by over 200 Messerschmitts and Falk Wolves. He lost men, he lost ships, and couldn't strike his blow. That's rough. Here's Peter Provenzale. Remember him? Arges navigator? Today he got a 20 millimeter through the leg. cable shot in two, but some wounded gunner wouldn't quit. He tied them together. In there. Both waste gunners, huh? The docks are working on them now. One's pretty bad. Bob Wallace, co-pilot. He slammed one through the cockpit, tore into Wally below his knee. Bulletproof glass. Well, Sergeant, guess you live right. Yes, the bombardiers with their first aid kits had plenty of work today. Crawling back to the bomb bays, trying to keep a steady hand in the rough going. <laughs> Many of your pals left you that day.
Bring it up, you guys. This is another loading. But if you happen to catch one in the wrong place, they've got a pretty nice repair shop. Ever see a sergeant flip a tulip in a lieutenant's face? Well, you just did. Yeah, while the gang at the base carries on, you can take it easy for a while. How are they fighting, Sarge? Nice fat fight, hmm? This one's been stretched a little. We drop in on Lieutenant Bob Wallace to see how he's doing. How are you feeling? Great. I'll be out of here in a couple of weeks. Oh, Miss O'Neill, it's Captain Gable. How do you do, Captain Gable? How do you do, Miss O'Neill? Wally, I never got a chance to ask you. Uh, uh, tell me just how, what happened when you got hit. Well, we'd uh, left the target. We were on our way home. We got to the coast, and we had our guns stowed away. A couple of FW snuck up on us and gave us a good burst. Oh, I see. You had your gun stowed away, huh? That's right. That was a little early, wasn't it? It certainly was. Uh, it's not a very good idea to relax over here until you get back to your own base. Is that right? That's right. Well, go ahead. Then, then what happened? Well, we, uh, after I got hit, I climbed down out of the uh, pilot's compartment and uh, got the top turret gunner to help me down into Bombay. He gave me some first aid, put the turret on my leg, and took a good, good job of it. Well, that's fine. I guess you think it's a good idea for these combat crews to have first aid training then, is that right? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. So, Wally, what do you think of the B-17s? Your uh, instruments, your guns, and all the rest of the equipment they're giving you to fight this war with? It's the best equipment in the world. That's good. Say, I hear you got your Purple Heart, too. Yes, Colonel Kennel was in the other day and gave it to me. I was more nervous than when those FWs were diving on me. <laughs> well, outside of that, are they treating you all right around here? Did you hear that, Miss O'Neill? Wally's doing okay. Back at the base, they repair your ships, too. The busiest legs in the outfit belong to Major Ace Aiken, the S-4. This airplane's got to fly in the morning. It's going to be ready. Well, Major, I don't know, sir. Well, let's have no ceremony. Let's get the fans turning. Keep the fans turning. The slogan of the ground crew. They work hard, these boys. They work 90 hours straight without sleep. But your ship is their baby. And she's got to fly. And if you need to repair a few thoughts, Sunday's always a nice day for it, if there's no raid scheduled. What do you know, kid? This church was built 900 years ago. Over at the hospital, Father O'Connor celebrates the Mass. The boys receive Holy Communion. Here's Pete Provenzale. He's leaving the hospital tomorrow. Flying Cross, Soldier's Medal. 
Dan, Ma, and that certain girl. They'll cut out the clippings and drive the neighbors nuts. Bombardier Stevens, the DFC, because he's been batting a thousand over Germany. And one to pilot Peters. He had to ditch in the channel, but his coolness and courage saved his crew. Bill Howells gets two clusters on his air medal for straight shooting. DFC to Tim Touchett. A folk wolf and a mountain lion? No difference, he says. The control wires were shot in two. So the DFC to Sergeant Del Conti, who tied them together. His hands punctured with flap. A silver star finds itself next to Provenzale's purple heart. He refused first aid till the Jerry fighters quit and stuck to his gun. The day the group led the wing over Schweinfurt, Colonel Hatcher was air commander. To him, the Silver Star. And the DFC to Kenny Hulls. Colonel Gross is smiling because Kenneth was having a coke in the PX when his name was called. Are you forgetting your five confirmed Jerry Sergeant? We're not. And they don't forget you when you're a little battle weary and need a rest. At a very gay seaside community, a world famous resort hotel has been converted for your pleasure by the Red Cross. A great place here. Sleep, eat, or what have you. Not on your life, Clark. None of that here. Oh, but look, Art, just a few shots. Oh, we're here for a rest. Right, you guys? Right. All right. Well, all right, then, how's this? I'll follow him around with a silent camera for one day. Don't have to say a word. Good deal? Good deal. English Surrey with a fringe on top. Mm, nice fringe. Carry you to the old swimming hole. Flaps and slide in. Now let's see what the boys back at the base are doing. Why, they're getting a few laughs too. We'll let the man who's handing them out tell you about it. Hello, everybody. This is Bob somewhere in good old Jolly Hope. Laying a few eggs for the boys that really know how to lay them. Yes, sir, this is one of the happier cow pastures that we worked in over there in England. And look who's dancing. <laughs> you know, I used to dance with Fred Astaire, but we couldn't get girls. And right here you see Jack Pepper, who was here through the courtesy of his draft board. His picture's a little dark, I understand, but after we were there a couple of weeks, we got a little braver and we started to work with the lights on. This is really a great, great crowd out there tonight. And I understand Rhett Butler is on the fringe of the crowd. They tell me that uh, they stopped him from flying in those B-17s. They claimed his ears held a plane back. Nice little scene. Shows Pepper trying to get his expense money. Look at that mob. You should have heard him cheer when Francis Langford walked out and when Tony Romano played the guitar. Yes, sir, you'll never know how this bunch of boys picked up our morale. And again, the weather breaks over the continent. And the handwriting on the wall spreads your story. You're into the third panel now. You've been out eight days in a row and done a double header over France on the ninth. This man's air force is piling it on. New combat wings have been added. New air divisions formed. So you're not very surprised when General Aker comes that day. Something big is up. He goes into the briefing room to confer with the old man and his staff. They call in the squadron commander, even the flight commander. What did he tell them? Your four squadron COs, they know, but don't talk. Just grin a little with excitement. It's something big, all right, because the bomb dumps have been getting plenty of heavy stuff lately. And a loading order came through this afternoon. Stand by. More than that, wing racks. We're really going to pile it on. That 
night, as always, when you know a real dilly is coming up, you're a little restless. Out in the dispersals, you hear them winding up those engines. That's all right, ground crew. Make them sing. Make them sing good. Control gives a signal to the Thunderbolts. They climb upstairs to overtake you. Pilot to crew, pilot to crew, over enemy 
code on the ball you got. right, you guys. Laugh it off. Right now, a bum joke goes better than two fingers of rye. Around three hours out, Arch looks at his watch. He knows it's time for the fighter escort to turn back. From all over the ship, you watch them leave. You're really on the ball now, because you know that enemy fighters will appear any minute. They know exactly where you are. They've been watching the stratosphere condense off your wingtips giving you away in long trails of magnificent treachery. Okay, here they are. Nine o'clock high, enemy fighters. Same thing at three o'clock. Yes, at least those vapor trails work both ways. Arch watches the enemy formations as they parallel your course. Seems obvious. They're staying out of range, going out ahead to turn in for a frontal attack. High. All turrets swing about to help guard the rear. Top turrets hunt the sky above in all directions. There's some more out there. Keep your eyes peeled. Now it comes. The enemy pours in at you from every point on the dial. Again and again they come. Twelve 
o'clock high, four o'clock level, out of the sun, and up from the ground. another flak area. It's heavier this time, so black and thick you can almost hear it, and it's more effective. Shorty's been hit in front of number four. Cover him all you can, everybody. trying to cover up. Too late. In desperation, through his own flak, the final Hun fighter makes a pass at the low squadron. Driven off. But still... Did a flat or a flak get that ship? Flak, I think. for the bomb run. This is your attack. All right, Steve. We're on the IP. She's yours. I got her. around you. Bombs away. The lead group picks out his MPI in the dock area. Let's go with the heavy stuff in the big incendiaries. The high group heads for the industrial section and hands out the same medicine. anti-personnel bombs. A nice pattern, Bombardier. Good deal. You can't hear what's going on down there, five miles below you. Marshalling yards and chemical tanks, ships and warehouses, spare engines and ball bearing factories are disintegrating in molten chaos. It's thunder out of the Alleghenies, Adolf. You said Americans were soft and decadent? Well, here's a red, white, and blue headache that will help you change your mind. The bomb 
day door is closed, take a last look at the target area. The smoke from its burning debris rises 16,000 feet into the air. More flak. The aim's still good down there. How about this trip home? Is it going to be rough? Pilot to crew. Pilot to crew. Well, you guys, we're over an hour out. They haven't come back at us yet. Looks like we're lucky this trip. Enemy fighters. 11 o'clock high. California still have a long, tough rainbow to travel, but they're looking the enemy right between his eyes. They're fighting in the American way, their American way of life. Enemy of America, look at these men. They're not going to lose, brother. 